And let me introduce the next speaker at the same time. So Kate Rose talking about the combat surveillance and sartorial hacking. So big round of applause. Thank you. Cool. I think we're getting started a little bit early here. Thank you so much for everybody for coming. Uh, I am Kate, and I welcome you to Adversarial Fashion, Sartorial Hacking to Combat Surveillance. Uh, in my full-time job, I actually work uh, to help organizations that do social good work to get the kind of technology and security resources that they need day to day. Uh, in my part-time life, I actually spend time designing and selling uh, novelty fabrics that usually have things on them that are for kids, like uh, manatees or you know kittens playing around uh, quantum teleportation diagrams, and of course, pillows that look like cuts of meat. Uh, so weird print definitely no stranger. Uh, today's talk as a result is going to be a sample of the surveillance systems that utilize computer vision technology, some art projects that other artists have come up with in order to counter or interfere with or engage with these systems, and then you are going to get a full end-to-end -end tutorial on how you can do this yourself and design them on any kind of fabric or other application we call these surface designs uh, to put on just about anything that you want. So buckle in. We're, we're going to get going. I want you to mostly take away from this that it's actually never been easier for all of these amazing designs that we read about and see online and even hear in talks here at DEF CON to actually come out of the computer and into the real world. And so we can put people, them in people's hands a lot easier than we think we can. So we have our problem set, which is that uh, surveillance technology is uh, everywhere. It is prolific. You've probably been in a couple of other talks that tell you how voluminous it is. Uh, often that technology is implemented by folks who are uh, themselves not AI experts. They are using stuff that's been quickly churned out. Uh, it's implemented in strange ways and in places that you wouldn't really think is a great idea. I think the big thing that I often have a huge issue with is that they generate these massive, kept forever, like high highly sensitive PI-laden databases that are themselves sensitive to attack. So we can hear, see an example here of how uh, there was a border agency that was taking like, photos of license plates and even of people at the border, all breached. So we're going to go over uh, a little example of kind of how these systems work, just as a, a little background. Uh, I'm going to start with one that I think folks are, are very familiar with from, from uh, this space, which is... Uh, facial recognition, so how does that work? You have an input image, it's usually a large field and there's a human being in it, uh, it's broken down into quadrants and decided which quadrant or little section of the photo has something that is likely to be a person in it. Uh, it detects and puts a bounding box around it. So the idea is that it's gonna crop in and then start running it through that fabulous deep neural network. Uh, this is uh, an amazing sort of diagram from uh, OpenFace, which is one of the libraries that uh, uses this technology. And and then it runs it through these sort of other measurements. So we're looking at clustering, similarity detection, classification against a training set, or sometimes in case it's uh, against an identification set. So you can identify who that is right there. Thanks, Sylvester. Uh, unfortunately, there are some unintended consequences with the way that that particular type of methodology of how it goes through the technology works. Uh, you, there is a system in some cities in China that's implemented where if you are a jaywalker, it uses facial recognition to try and identify and then shame you on giant billboards and then issue tickets occasionally. Uh, unfortunately, there was a very famous businesswoman who uh, herself was, was caught jaywalking, but it turns out that she's actually on the side of a bunch of buses. So uh, it actually then puts up her government ID, uh, misspelled surname, all these kinds of things that I don't think you would really want blasted across a billboard. Uh, so now we're going to automate license plate readers, which is kind of like the, the guts of this talk. Uh, it works a lot in the same way. So instead of being, uh, in this case, it is in addition to being on streets, it is also primarily on cop cars. Uh, so those have a couple of major components, the plate capture cameras, which are sitting on the top, and then you have a processor, because this is a lot of information that's coming in all the time, we'll get into how much. And then there is a front end, so there's like a, uh, a, an application that the police officer officers in the car can actually work with, as well as uh, store any of the data and then parse it later. 
So uh, this is actually a sample. Uh, you can find all these, by the way, at the EFF website. But this is actually a slide from the Anaheim Police Department training on how to use the resulting data and then go back through it. So you can see this blue line is actually a path that a cop car took. And uh, when it was looking for a particular plate, and it can tell you like the number of plates scanned, whether the target, which is like the hot plate or the one that is under investigation that we're looking at, um, you'd see this like little tiny uh, note right there where it's a little pin. That that's how close you can get in terms of like figuring out kind of in what range uh, that plate was spotted. So the big problem with this kind of technology is that unfortunately it is always on and it is basically everywhere tracking absolutely everyone. Uh, they can collect thousands of plates per minute. Uh, from the EFF website they say one vendor brags that its data set includes 6.5 billion scans and grows at a rate at 120 million data points every month. In aggregate over time the data can reveal a vehicle's historical travel. Um, those of you who were in Senator Wyden's talk the other day on uh, cell phone companies and how they kind of keep all of this stuff forever and that it's just so voluminous and it gives this like intense tracking of like point by point of your day, often your license plate can do the same thing. So just as dangerous to keep around forever with kind of no limitations whatsoever on its use. Uh, unfortunately, there is another unintended similar consequence. Uh, I live near Los Angeles. There are lots of malls that are actually in the LA area that uh, have this technology that when you walk into the mall, uh, you get your little ticket and then when you come back to your car after you're done shopping, you put it into the machine and it tells you where you're parked. Wow, that's really convenient. Uh, except that it's doing that because there is a license plate reader trained on absolutely every single spot and they marked your license plate when you came in. You have no way of knowing this, but that data was then also packaged and sold to one of the vendors for ICE. So you don't have any way to know that where you're driving in places and you're just like using a convenience technology that involves your license plate, who is actually running packaging and then reselling that and using it to often terrorize your neighbors. So there are two major methods for confounding the technology. Uh, I, I think there's probably more, but I like bucketing them into these two. Uh, you can either block the collection of information or you can overload it with additional information. So one we are trying to prevent those uh, scanners from actually reading in the correct kind of diagram of your face or your body or something different. Uh, and in another one, we're trying to replicate that detection over and over and over again. We'll actually go through these two examples. Um, so we're actually going to focus a little bit more afterwards on obscuring with additional data. Uh, this is a Calvin and Hobbes strip. I'm going to just read it because it kind of gets to the point. Uh, Calvin says, I'm filling out a reader survey for Chewing Magazine. See, they asked how much money I spent on gum each week, so I wrote $500. For my age, I put 43. And when they asked me what my favorite flavor is, I wrote garlic and curry. And Hobbes says, this magazine should have some amusing ads soon. And he says, I love messing with data. So artists have traditionally, uh, over the last couple of decades, and more recently used both methods to especially mess with digital surveillance technology. Uh, so drones, when they are seeking out targets, they often look for a heat register of a person. So there's a fashion designer who has uh, actually built anti-drone ca anti camouflage apparel that is meant to block that uh, heat signature using a reflective fabric. Uh, this one is a really cool example. Uh, a technologist and artist Adam Harvey uh, worked with a bunch of makeup artists and came up with this thing called CV Dazzle or Computer Vision Dazzle. It's named after when people would, uh, or I think back in uh, World War II, I believe, they would put on the boats uh, this sort of like wild black and white pattern that at a distance would kind of be hard to visually interpret. So uh, taking inspiration from that, uh, there's things that you can do to a face that actually when you draw that little bounding box around it, it makes it really hard to run it through through that neural network and effectively compare, it, compare and match to different faces. Uh, so this is one of the face charts that they came up with. And then uh, I, I also really love sitting on the idea too of the fact that the point of this project was also to develop resources for other people to use. Uh, so they have these sort of styling tips that you can find on the website. And then they also used face charts, which are diagrams that makeup artists actually use to uh, share styles, uh, convey concepts, and teach one another. So uh, that him and a bunch of of these makeup artist friends, they developed an entire library of resources for you to use. Uh, he also then developed these stickers, which you can see on this gentleman, uh, which can then just be kind of placed on your face instead of having to worry about having a full makeup kit, which I think is a, an important accessibility note. 
Uh, so this one is pretty cool too. Uh, there are a few scientists in Belgium that have uh, been working with those image recognition models that not only try to tell where your face is, but also is this entire object a person? Uh, this little sticker or tile that you can see on this other person uh, is meant to sort of break up the form of the body. It makes the image confusing. So if I have something that looks like, you know, when I'm making those little quadrants or those little squares as, as the uh, computer vision technology, that doesn't really look like a person. It's just kind of a floating torso and some legs. Um, but as you can imagine, the tile is kind of challenging because it only really works in one direction. Uh, this one I think is super funny. Uh, so instead of worrying about your face being recognized, a artist named Leo Savaggio uh, decided that you can just use his face. Go ahead. The printing files are online. You can just go ahead and take them, uh, stick it on, and, and it does work. It, it absolutely does read as this gentleman. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's called You Are Me Surveillance is the project. So that's been touring. And then uh, back to Adam Harvey. Uh, man, he's working overtime. Uh, he developed this textile pattern called hyperface. So the, uh, a lot of times when we're looking at those facial recognition images, uh, it's looking for some of these like density or suggestion of dimension. So you have like these little spots that might be a little like eye depressions, uh, face and nose. The shadowing can be very important, often more so than like the little stick figure smiley. Uh, and you can see here that trying to basically replicate that in different sizes as many times as we can is we're trying to distract and get those bounding boxes around each of those parts of the image. Uh, okay, so now we're sort of like from hyperface turning the corner into additional uh, use of that overload of information. Uh, they, an artist named Simone Nikhil uh, decided to basically use shirts that uh, replicate people whose faces are very, very often found in data sets because they're celebrities. So in Facebook, it kind of overloads the auto tagging function. Uh, and now, my stuff. Um, so this is a t-shirt that was developed to basically trigger automated license plate readers. Uh, we have basically uh, open ALPR and then a couple of other commercial plate readers were used to make this. Um, here it is on an actual human. Uh, you can see that it reads in as a variety of different plates and then you have it also on the back. This particular API also tries to give you some information on what it thinks the vehicle orientation is and the color, which is kind of interesting. So apparently it's an SUV crossover. <laughs> so you can see also I have this dress on right now. It is actually the text of the Fourth Amendment and uh, it works pretty well. So we're going to try to get into <laughs> Thank you. I hope this is visible, but this is a live video feed on one of the commercial applications uh, called Easy ALPR. You can see those bounding boxes lighting up. Excellent. All right. So yeah, um, you can see also the captured number here is kind of interesting. Uh, the number of plates that it seems. There is the dress I have on right now. Lighten up like a Christmas tree. It really loves it. So some things just really seem to kind of scratch the itch for certain APIs. <laughs> and we'll talk a little bit about why. Oh, and just a quick time check. I think we got the half sign, but I believe this is a 50 minute talk. Okay, just checking. Thank you. All right, cool. I was about to say, I'm very frightened. I have a lot of slides left. Um, <laughs> so you can see it works on video feed. Very excited about that. And we're going to talk a little bit about why uh, I used commercial apps and awesome how you can design your own. Some of you might be saying, that looks super cool. I love it. Others might be saying, I think I could do better than that. And you know what? The rest of this talk is for both of you because now you're going to learn how you can do that because art is for everyone. Uh, so you can pick your recognition system, anyone you like. You can try ALPRs as well. You can go for facial recognition. You can go for those whole people. Uh, and then you're going to look up those libraries and APIs. Uh, at the end of the talk, you're going to have a link to a bunch of these resources where you can try them. Uh, I'm also going to very much encourage you to use commercial applications. And the reasons for that are a couple. Uh, they can be found everywhere. You can just pop open Snapchat or uh, Apple's facial recognition in the photo function, easy ALPR. Uh, there are so many, and it's an easy way to check your work. Um, and in, there's, it, it kind of is a binary output, though. So you're either going to get a, you know, it'll respond to you, 
or it won't. You can't really look under the hood and see those confidence scores or other markers. Um, apps usually also collect other tracking data, so I, you know, your mileage may vary. Please read the terms and conditions and make sure you're cool with all the stuff it's going to ingest while you use it. Uh, so. I actually think this is really important for a couple of reasons, but mostly because of the way we're, we're going to work together to design this experiment. So in the real world, with government surveillance systems, I can't look under the hood. I usually am not going to get access to like even the training data sets that they used. I can't peel apart the neural network layer by layer and see the logic that it's using. Uh, I'm going to get as few outputs and success indicators as I will for commercial technology. So an ideal design experiment should be structured to be robust against those black box systems. And commercial applications can actually give us some of the similar effect that we're going to have. Um, something that I also found out even just in the course of this time at DEF CON is that uh, if they are very similar, it is for a very good reason, and that's because often uh, commercially sold applications that are used by state agencies have training data sets that are typically not uh, statistically significant really from uh, public data sets that are going to be online and used by some of these open systems. So I'm going to have you start then with your high confidence images. So in the case of open ALPR, there is a benchmark folder inside the repo. You can usually go dig through and find them. Um, or you can kind of collect your own. I suppose it's a little bit more painful. But uh, platerecognizer.com also has a bunch of folders of them. Start with those high confidence images. And we're going to talk about what that means. So when I read a, a photo into the API, it's going to spit out all that interesting information back at me, uh, including a confidence score that it is this particular plate, what the area of the in the photo that it is, and then it's going to give me back all that information about like I think it's an SUV crossover, or you know maybe it's a Jeep Wrangler. I don't know. So now you're going to test your tolerances. You have this like awesome folder of very high confidence images. You're going to make gentle modifications to the source images to test the tolerance of those systems. I'm basically holding up a bunch of cards to the API, and I'm asking it, what do you see? Uh, so shift the orientation, change the sizing, add and subtract parts of the image. You can cut them in half, rotate them, slice and dice them, change the colors and the contrast. Try also like moving them kind of sideways so that it would be viewed at an angle. Some of these systems actually try to like clip and then rearrange them if they're at an angle. Some don't. You're going to want to find out. Uh, and I would say if you have this, do it in whatever way is fastest for you. There are some libraries that will let you do this in Python. Uh, I actually personally have been using other kind of image modification products for, I think, like 10 years. So I am just physically faster at doing it that way. But either way, uh, my preference is to just basically build up this giant stack of images. And I've kept careful track of like how I've modified each one and like whether I'm trying all one state or different states. And then I just batch test them. Um, you can do this right from the command line. So just to touch briefly on what Pillow is, uh, it's not the world's like most feature rich, but it does have some things that I do recommend playing with. And one of them is the dithering function. Uh, it just all it does is take an image and kind of guess at turning it into a black and white only image. And that is very, very effective for kind of getting some of that feedback that you want in a decent amount of time. So let's take a look at kind of what I did. Uh, so here we have the license plate game. Uh, and, and this image is actually one that you'll start to see come up quite a bit just because it sort of ended up being this like stock photo for samples of different states' plates. Um, so I run it through the API. And honestly, they all look pretty good. They work really well. I'm pretty confident at what they look like. Uh, and I think I don't know what the problem is with that last one down there. It's just not cooperating, Wyoming. So now I've desaturated the image. And you can see where a couple have dropped out. They're kind of not as confident as they used to be. And I'm going to now kind of run it through what I thought was that sort of dithering function. And you can see a couple more drop off as well. Uh, also, the images are kind of noisy. Uh, there's obviously like a lot that you're not going to get out of just like straight up converting an image to only black and white. So uh, my process after that was sort of just to like keep carving out chunks of that noise, the thing that like makes it look messy and not, not designy, uh, and see how often it still works. So this is an example of me testing my tolerances here. Uh, so I have this Nebraska plate. I piled up a bunch of images, and I did weird different things to them. I decided to uh, change the font. Can I use a license plate font I found online? Can I cut up the letters? Can I rearrange them? Can I change the spacing? Can I get rid of? like any suggestion of an outline around the box, uh, what's going to work and what won't. So you can kind of look at these, guess in your head which ones are going to work. 
that wasn't what I expected, I'll be honest. Um, so it can be very, very challenging, especially I'm going to have you note the top one where the spacing is different from the bottom one. Uh, hint, both of those aren't officially the way Nebraska is supposed to actually arrange its plates. So you might get some feedback that surprises you. Uh, but as a result, you're going to come up with these, you know, after holding up your cards to your image and having all these different questions that you ask, you're going to get a really awesome set of answers. So you, I like to call these Q attributes. Uh, you start to get a gut sense of like what matters to this recognition system versus what does not. And often what features have disproportionate, uh, you know, impact on whether it's a confident. So you can see the little screws here. Um, those like sort of design attributes that are like typical to a state plate. So they're like live free or die in New Hampshire. Um, even if I carve out a bunch of it, it kind of expects to see something up there. Uh, and then the distance between the letters, uh, that's also going to vary based on which state you're, you're looking at. Uh, and some other stuff. So there's like on some state plates you have like registration stickers and other little suggestions of images. I actually carved out a much more complicated uh, image that was in between those letters and replaced it with this little dash. Still worked. So I advise try, trying that as well. Uh, I think these are actually really important because what we're doing here also is developing these rules of thumb that you don't actually have to be, uh, you know, you have to be a coder to replicate them and use them wisely. I think we want to be able to communicate to people in other disciplines like what matters and what doesn't. Uh, I love working also with like people across lots of different spectrums of uh, talent, both in tech and art. And I think just developing a better vocabulary for us to talk to each other is uh, a really, really big part of this exercise. So plot enough of your images and you get a distribution of what seems to work. So here was mine. This is just what I found helpful. Uh, you might get, I think there's probably going to be a couple more axes if you're using like a facial recognition system. But you have either that your font and your design elements are hyper accurate. It looks a lot like a plate, like it lives in a little rectangle that the image expects to see. Um, or it doesn't. Or the design elements are not accurate. Obviously, the ones that work really well are <laughs> both accurate in both dimensions, and it's basically a photo of a plate, and I think that's super boring. So here we have some other things that actually still seem to work. So there was that state plate print I showed you where uh, the font and design elements are more accurate, and uh, it works pretty well, even though those, there's like no little rectangles for things to live in. It doesn't look a lot like a plate. And then this Fourth Amendment print that I'm wearing right now, um, these all look a lot like a plate, but the font isn't accurate at all, actually. Uh, and it is missing a couple of other design elements that it would expect to see. Still works. The awesome thing about figuring this out with whatever system you're using is those are awesome spaces to make art. You can really have a lot of fun, and that's where you learn that you have wiggle room to introduce design elements that you still think are kind of cool looking or that people would want to wear. So I wanted to touch on this because I get this question a lot, which is why don't you just make your own plates that work really well? Uh, so let's look at the EU pl license plate standards. To my friends from Europe, I can't wait to see what you do with this tutorial because you are going to have a much easier time. Um, there are like, there's amazing diagrams online of what it's supposed to look like by law. Uh, it defines very specific things like space between the characters, the width of the stroke, which font. Uh, it even has like a sort of order of operations of what the different letters and numbers mean um, versus the United States. So here's a list of just one state, Idaho, and it's coded by county, and they're all different, and it only changes if the previous one, all of them have been used. So uh, that's one state. I made a little meme for this, which is uh, from Ron Swanson from uh, Parks and Rec, where he says, not to worry, I have a permit. And he just hands a piece of paper and just says, I can do what I want. So <laughs> America. All right, so these are some of the things I ran into that, that did slow me down. Uh, they were challenging, so just expect them, and I think you'll have a good time. Uh, you have to balance whether or not it looks like a plate especially. I mean, getting rid of that rectangle, it just doesn't like it. So you're going to have to struggle against that a little bit. Uh, other desired design attributes, obviously I don't want to like have it always look like just a pile of plates. It's worth the effort, but I think you're just going to spend a little more time on it. Some states' fonts and spacing don't work in other state plate formats, and you might find yourself suddenly trying to like mix and match a little too much, and then suddenly everything stops working on one side of the image, and you're like, dang it. Um, sometimes the API will also, as we saw in my example of the ones that are all modified in different ways, allow another state plate's lettering uh, format to fake out what it expects to see for that state. As a result, I've gotten ones where it, like, it's clearly a plate that says Missouri on it, but the API loves to tell me it's from Florida. I can't make a change. I can't figure out why. Uh, 
So uh, deciding, I'm going to also spend a little time on this one, which is deciding where to ethically source your plates, faces, or any other images that you're going to use. So uh, I did my best to find what I guess I would call out-of-use images. So things that are like functionally public, they're kind of like a stock image or something that's been reused a lot or it's on Wikipedia or, you know, it's just functionally something that it's so public that like you adding that to the set isn't really going to change much. Um, or they're functionally out of use. So you can go to junkyards and buy old ones. You could find them hanging on a wall of a restaurant or on eBay or on craft decor. So they're things that are, people are not driving around. Um, I also get the question a lot, which is, why don't you try to figure out whether or not they do belong to somebody? Because that costs a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, it is one of those things where like, you're not supposed to be able to pull that information just from any play on the street. If you do have enough money, anything is available to you. I do not have enough money. So I just have to do what is within my power as an artist and a good person and somebody who's trying very hard to like, be a good example uh, to do what I can without either being a millionaire or otherwise having access to perfect information. So please try your best. Um, also, that is to say, if you want to put your own plate all over a t-shirt, that's your decision. Uh, you know, might be then spotted around some other parts of town, and you might find that beneficial. <laughs> but I'm not the boss of you. So here's another amazing sample solution. Look at all these wonderful people's faces. Wouldn't they be fun to use on some kind of facial recognition project? Guess what? You can, because none of these people exist. They are from uh, thispersondoesnotexist.com, awesome sort of generative adversarial network. I'm going to flip back for a second. That just makes people, and they don't look like or they're, they're nobody. They might look like somebody, so just you know, model that out as best you can. So now I have my images that work. I figured out I have this great pile. Uh, I want to put them on fabric. They look awesome. Anybody can design a pattern. I really truly believe everybody in this room would be capable, like you may not think of yourself as like an art person or a fashion person, but I'm so glad that you are in here because you are absolutely have all the skills at your disposal. Um, so we have a front to back, this is like the rest of this talk is gonna be like how do I deal with all of the stuff that I have and then making it to the point where it's useful because I've read a ton of papers on amazing adversarial patterns and pictures and all these things that work. It's really hard to find out how to access them. And I think everybody in this room can also be part of that change on how we put those in people's hands. So basics, uh, the half brick is the thing that you're going to see most often. If you have a bunch of like things that work, just putting them together in a line, uh, then moving it down one and shifting it over about halfway uh, gives you a pretty aesthetic pattern. Works pretty well. Uh, the diamond repeat is actually the basis of most seamless pattern making. You might actually want to like, no, make note of this, not just for fabric, but I think any surface design. If you're thinking about in your head, oh, I'd love to put this on a car wrap or a mural or something interesting, you're going to have to know this. Uh, so I've changed the contrast a little bit so you can kind of better see what I'm doing here. Um, so you have these tiles that repeat. Uh, it's because each individual one, like I made this cool design. Let's imagine it's like a cluster of plates or something. I'm going to divide it into quadrants and then move the one from that side down to like, so if it's the top left, you're gonna move it down to the bottom right and complete that with every single quadrant. And that is how you get, it's really hard to tell actually, but I have a plate cluster and a circuit cluster. And all I did was I chopped it into quadrants and then I moved them down each corner and then I filled in the middles and then I got a beautiful seamless print that looks pretty nifty. So you could say, that sounds really hard, and like it involves math. It does. I'm sorry. So here I'm going to try to give you some examples of things that don't need math. Uh, so here is, again, our... Uh our glamouflage uh, facial type of t-shirt. Um, what they had done, the artist, is to just create these like horizontal blocks, and then they're a little bit different, the three of them, and they stack them staggered one on top of the other. Uh, this is really, really helpful because if you just go big enough, you could just slap a t-shirt right on it. It's really okay. You don't have to worry about whether it repeats and whether the edges fit together. So uh, the contrast in the images that you're using for your facial recognition patterns are very, very important. And then if you're like, oh, but I really like these colors and I want to make them work for my design. Uh, I think one of the things that's going to be really important to you then is to learn just a tiny little bit about color theory. I promise that this won't take very long. Uh, but tint, shades, and tones, so things that are mixed with white, mixed with black, and mixed with gray, those are going to affect your contrast of your final image, so pay attention. Uh, things that look good together tend to be all the same tint, tone, shade, levels. Uh, 
Uh, you're also going to find that when you're running this through image, uh, sort of image like editing software, um, you're going to want to like convert that to black and white once in a while and make sure you check uh, the actual technology is sometimes sensitive to that. So that's why the top looks great and the bottom, not so great. Uh, you can actually then, if you're like, this sounds super hard, you can extract different colors, like you have this DEF CON art uh, from last year. Uh, those are part of color families, the things that are all next to each other on the color wheel. Uh, we have a really cool EFF t-shirt from last year, which uses triads, which are two things next to each other, and one opposite also tends to look very cool. Uh, and borrowing is okay. I think like getting over the hump of like, I'm not good enough at this to make something that people would want to wear, just grab an image that looks aesthetic or uh, a piece of clothing in your closet you already like, and you can run it through some of these. I have the link list at the end of, uh, you know, like Adobe Color or Cooler or Degrave.com you can use to then extract samples. Monochromatic is also super cool. We're all hackers and we all like wearing black. Easy enough. So let's put it all together. My example here. Uh, we have our fake faces. I'm going to do some complexity reduction. Pretty simple, not going to spend a ton of time on it. And then do our derived color combination from some uh, other prior art. So I now have this facial recognition triggering jacket. All I did was just replace some of the colors and kind of strip out a little bit of the noise. And yes, it works. It doesn't have to be so hard. Uh, so here we have the Apple's facial recognition on the image, on the jacket. It does actually do what it's supposed to. You could continue reducing noise and improving simplicity until it stops working. And then you're going to get that information back on how you can make a pretty snappy pattern. So from pattern to production, this part's super important because I think we all have lots of great ideas, but getting it actually out there is a really big hurdle and has been previously. Uh, fabric is not pixel perfect. I really love the whole like turtle, you know, AI thinks turtle is a gun project where it 3D printed a turtle that the pixels had been moved around such that it uh, interfered with the model to the point where it thought it was a weapon. Uh, but full adversarial models tend to need to be pixel perfect and they only work in one direction. Uh, soft goods have a lot of constraints that way. Set your expectations to wearable clothing with reasonably durable imagery. So what is reasonably durable? You have to think about a wraparound pattern. Like this one goes all the way around. Uh, does it work with the curvature of a body? So I am a plus size person. I had to size up to make sure that things were not warped when they were either too small or fitting in a strange way. Um, as a result, can you pick fabric or materials that are going to help you out in that endeavor? Should your garments be loose or structured? Uh, this is a picture of a raincoat. Might that actually be stiffer and, and be more reliable when I'm kind of at different angles or sitting down or standing up? Uh, you're going to want to test and test over and over again. I'm going to get into some of the, the ways that you can actually develop prototypes, but I think each individual step is important. Flat digital prototype, test it. If you're using a system that lets you do a digital mock-up like this one, go ahead and run it through. I know it's not a photo on a real person, but it's helpful. Uh, and then you get your print prototype made, test it again. They are often uh, really good creator discounts at a lot of these sites, and so you can order some samples for, for quite cheap. So a uh, big thing here is that the digital printing process on fabric is made using a heat bonding dye injection process. It tries its best to get in between the fibers and it's not always very successful. So uh, you're going to want to make sure you work with the texture of your fabric, not against it. Work in very high files. I've seen so many things go awry because people like literally need more JPEG. Uh, so uh, you can actually also order fabric samples. They're like $2 and they send you this giant box and it has like hex codes actually printed on them. So uh, they, they really try to help you out here. Uh, so it's easier and cheaper than ever to make them yourself. Um, drop shipping is basically the process by which you have a design that's available online and it is only made each one. You don't have to hold inventory. You don't have to buy 25 shirts and keep them in your closet and hope somebody buys every single one of them, they are made to order. Uh, it is very low risk. Uh, you can print on demand. You can print samples very rapidly. I have vendors that I've worked with that I've really liked. Uh, Printful, they have a really awesome way that you can piece the pattern. It shows you where it's going to be the cut and sew service, so you can make sure that like things match up uh, and that it looks the way that you expect. Um, there's Contrato, which is actually this dress right here. A little bit more expensive, but very nice quality. Uh, Spoonflower, where they can make fabric by the yard in like 30 different ways. They can do wallpaper, which is pretty cool. They can do gift wrap in case you 
like giving weird nerdy gifts to people. Um, and then Wildemosh, which actually like looms sweaters. I uh, have a little mock-up sample here. I think I saw somebody in the audience who had this shirt on. Yeah. So um, love the art. So I decided, you know, you should look at it as a sweater. Imagine. Uh, so it brings the price of this prototype process way down. Before, it used to be that you would have to like be an academic at like an, insti you know, a, an institute and you have to get a budget to like make sure that you could actually afford to, you know, print these things out. Um, 15, 20 bucks. It really isn't that bad. So I think it's also really important to bring the final garment cost down because people will take a chance on that concept clothing if they can afford it. And honestly, a lot of these are also like increasingly they are like made in the United States. There's a really great uh, printful shop that's a provider for all over printing in Los Angeles. Uh, so it actually also might not take as long to get here as you think it will. So manufacturing your own. As you wander into the world of dropship, please, I, had, I just felt obligated to put the slide in here. Please don't get scammed. Uh, please read the reviews. There are lots of creators online who have told you like, which printers are good and which are bad. Um, it's reducing your risk. I don't think you're going to make mad stacks. I think you're going to like basically break even on a creative idea that you think the world needs to see. I think that's really, really important, and it's never been easier to do that. So you're going to be balancing your manufacturer quality, distance, shipping time to your happy customers, and the wholesale price. This is really important. I was so inspired. So there's an uh, indigenous artist named Mona Cliff who has been working on putting QR codes in traditional beading. Um, it's still, like, everything still works. If you use stenciling, uh, you can use silkscreen, beading, knitting, murals, like so many traditional handmade methods. It does not have to be digital. Still works in these recognition systems. Still can be read by uh, machines. So the objective here, just to kind of like sum that all up, is we're lowering the barrier to entry on caring about service surveillance. Everybody wears clothes, ostensibly. Understanding how the technology works is hard. Buying clothes and wearing them is easy. Something you can engage with in a tactile way makes it fun, and you can learn about it, like, and put a little card in when you sell it and teach people about why they should care about this thing. This is actually an anti-paparazzi scarf. When you try to hit it with a flash, it blows out the photo. Very cool. And if we want people to care about surveillance, I really feel like we're going to have to keep doing this in lots of areas. Um, you literally have to give people something they can hold in their hands and help them like understand and use it. And they could try it themselves on their own phone and really begin to understand like how this stuff that everybody in this room and we all carry very deeply and hope that they actually want to push back on these systems, they should really get a sense of how to test them themselves, be little citizen scientists, and then start seeing that everywhere. And I think clothes can be a great way to do that. So uh, just to give a a little uh, sprinkling of, of course, because this is the crypto village of other things that you could possibly think about if like triggering recognition systems is not your game. Uh, there are historical analog applications for fabric. This is actually a, uh, a letter addition square that was used to add five letter groups to a cipher. So it's like if you can actually learn in the next room about how these work. But uh, spies would have them either in the lines of their jacket or they would tie their hair up with them uh, or put them in their knitting bags uh, you, so that you could pull them out and they were quiet. They're printed on silk. They're reasonably very durable. And then they would say, like, okay, I've used this letter uh, transfer block, this particular cipher. And they would put pin pricks in them or embroidery in them to denote that they had been used. So pretty cool. So there are also people who are working on trying to embed them in other ways. So we have like some pretty cool, just like, you know, letter in substitution, like a, like a substitution cipher uh, put into fabrics and woven in. Uh, they can be done big or small. Pretty cool. And I think... I wanted to put in those slides because I'd like us to get thinking at the end of this talk sort of about how do we weave anti-surveillance design into the world. Uh, I think one of the big things that would have helped me a lot and how you, I think, encourage lots of other people to take attempts at this thing is to uh, empower collaboration. You don't have to do all the work yourself. Maybe you watch this whole talk and decide, I'm not very good at art. Um, and this all sounds very confusing and I'm not a fashionista. But do you know somebody else who is, uh, who could maybe unleash a lot of creativity? Could you make them a tool that lets them not have to use code to take these systems and engage with them. Uh, I think that's honestly the biggest thing that, that a lot of people could probably do. Throughout the process of doing this and, and continuing into some of the future designing, having the ability to like launch a simple tester app on things like, uh, you know, Android or on mobile devices in particular is like a really awesome fast way to check your work. 
So I think also we want to think about bigger, not just people. I think surfaces, surface design can be anywhere. Um, I would absolutely love to have a mural up somewhere either in like Metro Los Angeles or any major city where cop cars go by all the time and just put up some of these plate designs and see how much garbage that we can basically inject into uh, those databases as they pass by. Anything that you can do to make the data set less useful, they have to pay to store it, they have to pay to analyze it. Uh, just, I think every little bit of being non-compliant is super helpful. So think about like murals, billboards, clothing lines, posters for events like a hacker conference. So I really don't want to leave you without remember, like reminding you that this looks easy, but image recognition technology and computer vision technology keeps getting better, even in like that the, uh, the cycles of automation are so short now that, that I can barely keep track. Some of the anti-surveillance patterns that were created by other artists as I was doing research for this talk already no longer work. Happens. But that's the point, right? So hacking surveillance systems should maybe, I'm going to posit, not be about trying to outrun the arms race. How do we normalize mimicry aesthetics? How do we make it easier to do this on shorter and shorter cycles from our side of the equation? So remember, it's about developing a design methodology that you can repeat every time these things catch up. Uh, for continuous testing and iteration, it's not a one and done process. I think if you remember from the movie, The Fifth Element, I really love this guy. Uh, so, you know, Bruce Willis looks out in the hallway and he sees what he thinks is an empty hallway. And it turns out it's just the guy wearing a picture on his head. <laughs> it works. I don't know. So don't limit yourself. <laughs> So uh, I have all the slides up at uh, adversarialfashion.com. You can see resource links. Uh, those are, the slides will actually be up right after this talk. Uh, you'll also have resource links, so everything that I used, you can use. Uh, please treat this as a tutorial. Show me what you make. Uh, and then I have the available designs. So you can see how uh, they were composited onto different types of dresses. And I just love being able to say Fourth Amendment crop top. Like, that's a really cool phrase. <laughs> and then I really, really can't finish this talk without thanking EFF senior investigative researcher Dave Moss. Honestly, the concept couldn't have happened without him. He just mentioned in passing that like the specificity on this, these systems are low. They read billboards and fences and all kinds of junk. So uh, that unlocked a lot of creativity. So maybe information you share could do the same for somebody else. So I definitely invite you to go to EFF.org, check out their section on ALPRs. There's some pending legislation in particular uh, that might be coming to your state or if you are in California, has already been introduced previously. Uh, to take action on license plate privacy. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. So we do have some time for some questions. If you have a question, please come line up by me. Oh, my Twitter is uh, Kate Rose B like the insect. All right. No questions is okay as well. We have, oh, we got we some few. Okay, just check it. I have a question. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, do you have any advice or concerns about the fact that a lot of these algorithms for surveillance are also used for safety critical systems and automation? They also use what? Uh, sorry. They're also used for safety critical systems and automation, like self driving vehicles. Oh, that's really, really interesting. Um, I think one of the things that, uh, so just to repeat a little bit of the question, that some of these are like safety driven systems as well. Uh, so I don't necessarily always want to be fooling things that are. Uh, that we depend on to keep us healthy and safe. I think honestly you should then think about this as a way to report back to those companies that you found a mistake. Um, I think there's actually been some really cool research in particular of showing how like salt lines on the road. Um, I was, there's like another talk that was given on how to like red team AT, how to red team AI without being a chump. I like that title. Uh, and they, they had talked about the fact that if you salt the road in particular ways, that messes up lane, uh, lane detection for certain kinds of cars. I think if you identify something like that and you think that there are safety dependent systems that are, are messed with by these, you should absolutely write to the company, tell them what you found, treat it like any other kind of exploit. I actually think one of the things that, that kind of stinks about using um, license plates for so many different things is that like, yeah, it's, it's 
pretty much something that anybody could do with any plate they want, and I don't think as a result they should be used for highly sensitive things like incriminating you for, for evidence or you know, even ticketing you in, in a lot of cases. So uh, that would be my response, um, but otherwise, uh, great question. Thank you. Yeah, awesome talk. Really liked it. Thanks. Um, did you find anything about like uh, testing testing the, the a particular design across multiple models and finding that you know something worked really really well in one model but like really failed with another model that you had and like what did you learn from that? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, across the different open versus commercial systems that I was working on, so there's like easy ALPR, plate recognizer, and then uh, open ALPR. I found that the biggest variance was specificity. So um, some of them are that I think are meant to be used as like a person who is maybe a lay person using their mobile device. They are more sensitive. They will basically take in a lot of information of any, they, they overvalue that like rectangular function a little bit more than anything else versus something that's kind of like reading things in as a flat image as the primary function of the API versus a video feed tended to affect it. Um, so I think I like I have what I think are key takeaways, but I think with a larger training set, somebody else might come up with a different conclusion. Uh, but yes, they definitely vary. I think often uh, folks and they should, they frequently rewrite and make their own sort of like recognition algorithm that overvalues one thing over another, maybe based on customer feedback. Um, I would love to get my hands on one that's used by state agencies. Apparently you can get them on eBay, so uh, if anybody wants to pitch in with me, we can answer that part of the question too. So it seems like if your dress became really popular, the software providers could just start filtering out all the text of the Fourth Amendment and then they'd never get false positives anymore. Yeah. So is the tooling in place that you could make it so that every dress has different text on it? So it's very cool that you bring this up, but it's possible, yes. It's, it's one of the things that actually becomes really cool and interesting about the proposition is that because I have lowered the risk point, which would normally be, uh, if I'm, I'm normally a clothing designer and I have to like loom things or print them myself, remaking those, uh, w like without digital printing, like remaking screens for a silk screen or remaking um, loom, uh, like your loom orders with a wholesaler, that would be really hard. Now actually it's very easy. So if I find that it's screened out or they just don't like my clothing anymore, I can go on there, dig in my pile of plates that I have that still really work uh, or go find new ones. And honestly, like the, the don't overestimate the amount of time that this takes. Once you have a method, um, I think I can update a new design in like 20 minutes. So I can outrun them for a while. I think with like your collective help as well, if we're all coming at them from different angles, uh, it makes it a little harder. So thank you. Great question. Um, oh. One of the things I was thinking about immediately when you were talking about like all the modifications is yeah. possibly automating that so you could just throw something at a machine uh, at a model and then like it would do a bunch of different uh, you know color mm -hmm. modifications so you could quickly find something that was aesthetically pleasing that yeah. might look cool do you think that's reasonable or possible or like how much of it was like you as a human had to figure out like this would be a reasonable transformation I think it's super automatable, honestly. Uh, so some of the, even the technology that you were looking at that extracts palettes from different things kind of operates on functions that I imagine would be also similarly helpful. Um, so like having dials that kind of move it up and down. I am not the world's like most prolific uh, web developer or else like a tool would be amazing. But if people wanted to collaborate on that, I'd be super open to it. Um, all the methods of things I was doing are, if I use them in Adobe, it's just because my hands are faster than like literally figuring out how to code that image modification tool. Uh, but it's very possible. Um, I would imagine that slider bars, uh, samples of palettes, any of these things could easily be built together. Um, there's a lot of like really cool pattern making uh, tools that I often use online that you just drop a bunch of icons in, and drag them around, and it makes the, the repeat tile for you. Um, so it is, some of it to some extent actually is already out there. But uh, yeah, I think it would be pretty easy over time to, to work on that. I know that uh, I'm increasingly also really interested in like uh, generative adversarial networks as one tool to address that. And I think that's kind of the, er the area I'd like to explore next. All right. Something like that uh, screens you as an activist. Mm -hmm. So instead of being processed by a robot, end up being in the manual processing and your face will be very carefully recognized. Wouldn't that happen? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. So that, it would, well, that's a threat, right? So is there, well, how probable would it be that you are, since you are broadcasting, well, mm -hmm. 
distance, then you would be screened manually. I'm not sure I caught the question. I'm really, really sorry. The microphone was going in and out. I apologize for making you repeat yourself. Yeah, so what I'm saying, wearing this manifests that you are, well, resistance. Therefore, the automated system can uh, flag you for manual processing. So yeah, that's true. I think, like, honestly, that, that is just, like, one of the risk points that, that you have to incur when you're kind of working on this sort of stuff is that, um, you know, you can have items that end up flagged where they need to be reviewed by a person. Uh, I think the volume kind of works in our favor in this case. I think, uh, you know, the fact that plates are ingested so rapidly and these databases are gigantic and messy and implemented by people who are, generally speaking, not that they're not that thoughtful. I really like, don't mean to not flatter anybody, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a tool to get a different job done, and uh, I think like the actual investment in making sure that it's accurate is quite low. So, awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. This is a really wonderful, thoughtful set of questions, and I really liked uh, sharing with you.